Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ number 70, the knife series where I answer all your questions, whether they're sharp or dull. This week, amongst our topics, we're talking about different modifications you can do to some of your knives as well as giving you a rundown of the most common blade grinds. So let's get right into it. All right, if you've never seen one of these episodes before... Where have you been? Thomas is aggressive today, folks. <laughs> Down boy. If you've never seen one of these episodes before, the deal is you leave your questions in the comments section down below and we skim through and find some good ones to pick out and feature in a future episode. So if you want a chance for that to happen, do what we just said. Good job. Makes sense. Uh, <laughs> first question today says, uh, comes from uh, Jean Baptiste de Metz, who says, why are convex grinds so expensive? Uh, well, basically what it comes down to, the reason a convex grind is more expensive typically or can be, I should say, more expensive than some other uh, grinds if all things are being equal is they're harder to do in a production environment. Uh, and even in a, a handmade environment too, for that matter. So I'll get into why, but right here, if you're unfamiliar with a convex grind, you can see it here on this real steel bushcraft. Uh, this particular version uh, is about 90 bucks. So even though a lot of times convex grinds come on more expensive knives, you can get them on less expensive knives out there. In fact, you can even get shorter versions of this knife with a convex grind for about uh, $72 or thereabouts. But what you have here is, is exactly what it sounds like. The sides of the grind, the sides of the blade are convex. So they start off and they curve inward towards each other coming to that sharpened edge. Sometimes they can have a secondary bevel on it, sometimes not. Uh, this one just has a hint of micro bevel there. It takes a little bit more uh, precision and delicacy to do one of these. Let me, uh, let me back things up though and talk about the hollow grind real quick, which you see here on a, uh, a Chris Reeve Sabenza, which it's funny, I'm showing a, a very expensive knife to demonstrate something that's usually less expensive to do than certain other methods. But because you have a hollow grind where these are concave, it's instead of they, them curling towards each other like this, the edges or the sides are actually scooped out and coming up towards the secondary edge of the knife. And a lot of the reason you see some much more inexpensive knives than the Sabenza that come with hollow grinds is in a production environment using wheels with abrasives on it, you can hit both sides of this blade at the same time. So your production time is cut down. Stepping up from that, we have the flat grind, which unfortunately, you can't do two wheels at the same time because these sides are flat as opposed to convex or concave. So each side has to be done in a separate pass. So you've kind of doubled your, uh, your grinding time on a given blade by going to a flat grind. And usually there will be a platen behind the uh, grinding surface to keep that flat intact. Convex grinds require slack. Essentially, you, you can't have a platen behind there because then you're going to be doing a flat grind. And unless, you know, if you're doing any of these with a CNC machine, that's a different story. But most uh, production environments, especially more affordable production environments, aren't typically using that. To get the slack of the belt that's coming down to follow the contour you want and not grind past the edge where you want requires more precision, requires more skill to do well. So it's going to cost you a little bit more. So really that, I hope that kind of answers your question, uh, at least the nuts and bolts of, or the basics of why convex grinds, you see them less because they're more difficult and sometimes they carry that price premium too. As to why someone might choose a convex grind, if you're curious out there, they're very strong. It's essentially the same type of grind you might see on an ax or a hatchet. So obviously it can stand up to impact really well. It's got more, essentially more meat behind the shoulders of the edge than a flat or a hollow grind typically do. So it stands to reason it could stand up to a little bit more uh, abuse, shall we say. The other thing I like about a convex grind, especially for like outdoors use, bushcrafting, even craft stuff out there where you might be working wood, you can actually 
as you are on the piece of wood or whatever that you are working, you can use the shoulders of that grind to make contact with the surface and really angle that blade very precisely while resting on that shoulder. So if you're just trying to like skim off a really thin layer, you can use the rest of the blade to help you maintain that angle and not bite too deeply, or you can just go for it. Really nice thing. It's why you'll often see a, a convex grind on draw knives as well. Same concept. As for the hollow grind, complete opposite end of the spectrum, there's a reason you don't see con or hollow grinds on big choppers too often, at least not ones done well, is because the edge or the thickness of the metal behind the edge stays very thin longer than any of these other typical grinds. Over time, that means it's going to stay thinner the more and more it is sharpened. So you're, you know, you're building up less of a wedge than you would on one of these other grinds. And that can help the knife last longer or feel like it's, you know, performing more up to its potential for longer than, uh, than some other grinds. Again, we're talking something you're using for years and sharpening often without swapping off to another knife every couple of days, like a lot of us knife nuts do. So might not be a, uh, a concern for most enthusiasts, but they work really well for that specifically. And then the flat grind is kind of a good in between the, uh, the hollow and the convex. Keep in mind, let's pretend I'm talking about these things where the, the blade thickness and everything is equal between these. Obviously that can play a difference as well. But yeah, the flat grind has a little bit more meat behind the uh, edge than a hollow grind, but not as much as a convex. And of course it's gonna get a little wedgier as you're, uh, let's say you've sharpened a third of this blade off. It's gonna definitely have a thicker edge than if this were a hollow grind knife. Uh, this right here is a uh, CJRB Feldspar, by the way. Knife Center exclusive with the burlap handles. Really good deals, actually. I should tell you how much this costs since we're showing it. We do sell them. 48 bucks. Pretty good deal for this guy. Contoured, ball bearings in the pivot. Yeah, very nice knife. Couple other of uh, common grinds you'll see out there. Uh, you might see something with a compound grind, which kind of tries to blend a couple of these different styles together. You can see that very famously on a lot of Cold Steel's Tonto blades, like this mini Recon right here, $45 knife. The section here at the back is hollow ground. So you get the more kind of the longer lasting thinness behind the edge there. And when you're, when you're dealing right behind the edge, you're dealing with a thinner cutting edge as well. Longer cuts, a, a flat grind might do better depending on the, uh, the thickness of the blade, like if you're having heaving through some cardboard, because sometimes the shoulders of the top of the hollow grind can push things out a little bit. Talking degrees of difference here. Thomas, are the weeds up yet? Oh, they've been there. Probably. So we got a hollow grind on this back section, and we've got a flat grind on the front section of this Tonto for a little more strength, a little more meat behind the edge. Now you'll see compound grinds these days with two different heights of flat grinds because they're you know, balancing two different characteristics of the edge geometry there. But most often, or at least stereotypically, we think of it as combining a hollow and a flat on a Tonto blade like this. Last one uh, we'll talk about is the Scandi grind, which has some similarities to the convex in that it often comes, well, convex often comes straight down to a zero with no secondary bevel. A Scandi does the same thing. In terms of production though, this is essentially a simple flat grind, very short flat grind that they're doing. Although, staying in the weeds here for a minute, Mora actually uses a very, very, very shallow hollow when they grind these in at the factory. I mean, they're using really big diameter wheels to make that. Not something you're really gonna be able to notice, but it does make the first few initial sharpens a little bit easier and it helps them keep the prices on these down. I mean, this. Uh, Eldris Light Duty here. It's actually one of the more expensive Moras out there at $23, but still quite an affordable knife. These things work great, uh, especially I'd say at wood carving. It's kind of like a double planed chisel in that regard, which is why you'll see bushcrafters really gravitating towards this type of grind. All right, next question comes from Aaron Griffin. Hey DCA, how do you sharpen a convex ground knife? Also, if I scratch the blade, how do I fix the scratches? Uh, so the first thing you need to determine is if your convex ground knife has a secondary bevel or not. If it does, you sharpen it just like anything else. If it does not, it comes right down to zero. You're going to want to sharpen it on something that has a little bit of give, such as a strop. And 
we did a, uh, a strop sharpening video. You can check that out. We'll make sure to leave a link to that. And that goes through how you can take a strop and add some uh, very fine grained or fine gridded sandpaper and it can be your one stop shop for sharpening. But it's definitely a requirement for something like this convex grind unless you decide to put a secondary bevel on it yourself. And part and parcel to that is you're gonna scratch uh, the blade a little bit. That's what sharpening does. And since there's no definitive kind of delineation between between where the edge stops and the side of the blade begins, the top of that typically is where you'll see like a little bit of a, a scuff pattern that's a little bit different. And just like anything, if you're putting scuffs in something, in order to get them out, you have to scuff the rest of it back up to match and then sand it back, scuff it down to a finer grit. So you would have to go through the whole, the you know, the whole bevel of this convex ground blade in order to get those scratches out. But I recommend not even worrying about it. You're gonna scratch the blade a little bit, it's fine you're gonna be using this knife. If you're sharpening this knife, obviously you're putting it to use. Embrace the scratches, don't worry too much about it. Let the knife tell its story. All right, next question comes from Daniel 896 us Numbers. Numbers and letters as well. Uh, David, I have a question. I have question about the Sabenza. I'm left-handed and it appears the Sabenza is the only premium frame lock knife that's designed for the left handed. If so, I'm quite interested in this knife. While these only come with a hollow grind, would it be imprudent to have the blade reprofiled to a flat grind? As an alternative, is there another premium frame lock folder that's left handed and comes with a flat grind? My concern about the grind is the assumption that a hollow grind is harder to sharpen by an ordinary user. All right, let's break this one down. Uh, first of all, as to left handers, we had a, an interesting comment recently where I learned a new term for left-handers, Australian slang, Molly Duker. I didn't know that either. As we both had, Thomas and I were, who's, who was this? Who's we had to, Molly? We had to Google it and find out. Um, so that's fun. As for another frame lock folder that's left-handed and comes with a flat grind, uh, the Kaiser Gemini is available uh, occasionally. Uh, unfortunately, they're out of stock a lot, so it might be harder to get. As to a flat grind being harder to sharpen than a hollow grind, I'd say it's actually the opposite, but not by much. Honestly, both of them, whether you have a hollow ground knife or a flat ground knife, are going to be fairly easy to sharpen. The technique is going to be the same, your angles are going to be the same. There's no real difference there, but the reason I say if anything, the hollow grind will be a little bit easier is again, less meat behind the shoulders. So the more you sharpen, it's not getting as thick as quickly as a flat ground knife. So don't worry about the sharpening. Go with the, uh, the left-handed Sabenza with the hollow grind and enjoy the heck out of it. It's gonna work great. Would it be imprudent to have a Sabenza reprofiled to a flat grind? Yes, because with a hollow grind, you've essentially removed already the most metal out of any of these grinds typically do. So if you really wanted to get this back to a flat profile, you'd be grinding that down till that spine was super thin. I mean, you're, you're not gonna have the strength and durability that the Sabenza is renowned for if you go that route. You'd have to find someone who would do it too. And uh, a lot of people might go like, no, no, it's cool, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, don't put the genie back in that bottle. Technically, you know, one thing you can do, provided you have a drop point knife that the spine is thick enough, like this feldspar right here, you could have someone modify this to a hollow grind if you really wanted to. If you're starting with a really thin flat ground knife, like this Benchmade Bugout, for example, if you went and put a hollow grind on this, it probably, you probably wouldn't be able to get it all the way up the blade before you ran out of material, so you'd have some weird things going on. Technically, like I said, you could do it with a, with a drop or a, a flat ground knife, provided you have enough thickness, but don't worry about it. This is still gonna be easy enough to sharpen, or at least it's not gonna be that much more difficult than the hollow ground competition in that regard. But thin edges can help in either case. Um, you know, Chris Reeves typically have thin edges. Civivis uh, come with really thin edges these days, the flat and their hollow ground knives. So that'll help as well, because when you're that thin, less meat behind the shoulders. Hope that helps. Hope I answered all of your, uh, your questions in there too. We'll say I did. All right. 
Next question comes from Ben Gradle. Says, I like the blade length of the bug out, but it doesn't quite have enough handle length for my preference. I really like the action and rest of what Benchmade knives offer. I want to modify a bug out by making a custom handle extender and epoxying it on. Is there another knife that doesn't cost as much money that I should do this with to try it? Or should I just jump in and make my perfect Benchmade? Um, there is another knife I would suggest. It's not necessarily cheaper. Um, but this, uh, well, this particular Benchmade uh, bug out with the CF Elite handles, it's like 157. Take a look at the bailout right here, uh, about 166.50 for the base versions of this. It is very closely related to the bug out. It's basically the bug out handle with a couple of tweaks. You've got a little bit of a thumb ramp right there and you've got a longer handle. In addition to the bail at the end, which adds a little bit of length on its own, the handle itself, even before the bail starts, is a little bit longer. You can see here, holding a finger guard to finger guard there, you've got more to hold on to with that bailout. 3V steel on these, which is pretty cool. Uh, you can upgrade from this if you want a more rigid handle. Uh, I actually really enjoy the green aluminum handled versions of these and those have an M4 blade. In terms of modifications, it's gonna be a lot easier to modify this blade. If you really want a drop point, you can grind through the, uh, the Tonto tip here and sharpen it back up and have a bug out with a longer handle, essentially. Or you might find that this Tonto is gentle enough you don't really have to worry about reprofiling, reprofiling it because it's gonna use just as easily day to day. That's actually what wound up happening to me. I bought one of those green handled bug out or bailouts with the plan of reprofiling it into a drop point. Never got around to it because I just enjoyed it the way it was. And when you do something like this also, you can still take the part, take the knife apart for maintenance. And if you've modded a blade, you're, you've already voided your warranty anyway, so don't have to worry about anything in that regard. If you were to epoxy a handle extender onto one of these, your scales would then be stuck fit together and you wouldn't be able to adjust it if needed or clean it if needed. So you're gonna have a, uh, a better time, I think, just going with one of these. It might suit you right out of the box without having to worry about those mods. Or put a lanyard on it. Yeah, that's actually a good point that Thomas brings up. Um, one thing you can do, and I don't have an example here because I didn't even think of this. Thomas, you did a good thing. Sorry, I won't have it again. <laughs> if you're looking for a little more grip, one thing you can do is put a lanyard on the end of some handles right here. It might not work for you in particular in this case, but it might, and this might help some other people as well. CRKT uh, Minimalist is a good example of this on the real small side. With a, uh, a heavy fob sticking out, you can actually wrap your pinky around that and get more effective length. It's not rigid, but it almost doesn't have to be. It's really there more to keep the knife in your hand, keep the retention going. So yeah, I hope that helps. Good one, Thomas. You, you've been paying attention over the years, haven't you? Whoops. <laughs> Won't happen again, like you said. <laughs> Excellent. Well, now we come to the lightning round. Says, uh, first, says, the lightning round says, excuse me, can you tell it's the end of the day? James Goodlett says, I was wondering, can you buy a titanium frame lock with a decent steel for around $100? Yes, you can. Uh, before today, I would have said the one place you ought to look is the QSP Penguin. Titanium frame lock, 154 CM steel is decent stuff. 97 bucks for these guys, really nice. But then literally, as we were setting up today, this knife came in, the Ontario TI-22 Equinox Flipper. 99.95 Titanium Frame Lock S35 VN Blade Steel. Deep carry pocket clip, mostly deep carry. Flipping action, pretty decent. There you go, 100 bucks, everything you want. All right, next lightning round question comes from the X Johnny G. Hey DCA, is there any drawback with storing knives, storing knives on a magnetic knife strip? Um, the only one I can really think of, and I, I keep a knife uh, or keep my kitchen knives on a knife magnetic knife strip with exposed magnets, like on this uh, Henkel's holder here. It's like thirty dollars. If you go to pick up the knife and you drag it down, you do run the risk of scratching the blade a little bit, uh, which is why I tend to prefer. In fact, I do prefer a wooden magnetic knife brick. 
uh, still holds the uh, the knives just the same way and you've got a wood surface so much less likely to scratch the blade but in any case pulling it straight off is going to be helpful in either case um, can't really think of any other drawbacks specifically but if anyone in the uh, magnetosphere out there knows let us know in the comments below all right gabe cosby asks i'm trying to find a kitchen knife set that won't rust after the first wash in my dishwasher what brands do you recommend i recommend not putting your kitchen knives in the dishwasher ever at all full stop it's so bad for them not just because your blades might rust but it can wreak havoc on handles you can chip the edges because if as things are moving around in a dishwasher if you're if you know if it's not loaded carefully it's real easy for that edge to impact something even the uh the actual rack itself that could cause some damage if it goes the wrong way if you really insist though on doing it the only thing that's really going to stand up is probably a ceramic blade like this Kyocera 7 inch chef's knife right here it's 70 bucks i still wouldn't recommend doing it because this material is even more brittle than steel so you still run the risk of really damaging the edges on these and it's not a cheap knife either some ceramic knives out there are cheap if you're gonna put your knife in the dishwasher whether it's ceramic or whether it's steel or anything else you really ought to consider them being disposable items like Just, a restaurant steak knife like a restaurant steak knife those yeah you can put those in there that's fine but even they, you know, you might get some rust spots on those. Remember guys, stainless does not mean stain proof. It means it stains less than non-stainless steel. Well, so when they rust, I turn them into throwing knives. I would have hated working with you in restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> Although one time, maybe I shouldn't say this. I, we had some skewers in the kitchen and I was like throwing them at a uh, empty grease thing, uh, empty uh, grease box we had over there. And I hit the PVC drain pipe for one of our sinks and it stuck in and made a little hole in it. I wouldn't have liked that. It was hilarious. I'm sure it was, yes. But it was going straight down, so it never leaked because all the water was just going straight down past it. So it's fine. I put duct tape around it. It's all good. We don't work there anymore. <laughs> good. Which brings us to our most serious... It's the handyman's secret weapon, by the way. Yes. Uh, which brings us to our most serious question of the day, which is from Mike W. Uh, hey, DCA, I'm getting a new puppy soon, and I want to give him a knife-related name. Buck and Becker are taken... Any ideas? Thanks. Jack. Jack? Wow, like a jackknife. It's mm -hmm. pretty good. I was thinking Randall would be pretty nice. Infidel is fun. Uh, Nessmuck, of course. Carcass splitter. Carcass splitter. Here, boy. Here, little carcass splitter. Oh, that'd be great. On a dashend. <laughs> we could do this guy. It's the spider coat Pachi or Pochi, which is Japanese for puppy or dog. And it's a little dog knife. So there you go. I had to have the surprise uh, puppy reveal right there at the end. So, any other good uh, knife related dog names? I can't wait to see what you guys do in the comments section on this question. This is going to be a lot of fun, I do think. Let us know. Because that is the end of today's episode. Make sure to let me know what you thought of the answers. If you have your own answers to these questions, leave them below. And if you want to get your hands on any of these knives, We'll have links in the description to take you over to knifecenter.com. While you're over there, make sure you sign up for our Knife Rewards program so that when you spend your money on one of these knives today, you can earn some free money to spend on your next one. Don't forget to drop your own questions down in the comments below. Maybe you'll get picked for one of our future episodes. In the meantime, I'm David C. Anderson. That's Thomas over there. We're signing off. We'll see you next time.